Yes, sir. I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I'd like to talk about bridges today. Uh, bridges are really examples of uh, about as pure engineering as we can find. Sometimes architects are involved in consulting uh, for bridges, but generally speaking, they are pure engineering projects directed by engineers and, and conceived by, by engineers. The conception of a bridge begins in an engineer's mind. Uh, the engineer sees it in his mind's eye and uh, communicates it often uh, as a first approximation by a sketch uh, and then with increasingly detailed drawings that show the structural details of the bridge. The um, aesthetic components uh, come simultaneously with the engineering for a good bridge design. And I would like to show a lot of uh, uh, examples Bridges as art, I've called it. I hope I'll get this thing right today. There. Bridges are, are old. Uh, this is a bridge that's generally dated from, uh, from Roman times. Uh, so this is a roughly 2,000-year-old bridge that is considered today equally an attraction for people interested in the fine arts and in uh, structural detail. Uh, bridges like this serve as models for modern bridges. Uh, there are bridges that have been built in the United States, for example, where when you see them, if you know the history of bridges, you say, yes, that echoes the Pont de Gare. So in that sense, it's very much like creative uh, uh, art, that there's a lot of quoting going on. There's a lot of referencing back to historically significant works. This is a modern bridge. Uh, the Pont de Gare, of course, was in stone. This is in concrete. The uh, engineer of this bridge is Robert Maillard. He's a, he was a Swiss. He worked in Switzerland almost exclusively, and he was relatively unknown to the larger bridge world, but today his bridges are considered uh, works of art, not only because of their aesthetic value uh, to, let's say, the technically untrained eye, but to people who are trained in engineering and in structural engineering, especially of bridges, they see this as a form of, of minimum use of material. And uh, it, it cuts away everything that, that isn't necessary. So this would be uh, what we would call minimalist bridge art. Bridges today, they're still built in concrete. Generally speaking, concrete bridges aren't very graceful, although people who work in concrete might debate that. But there is a lot of work on uh, St uh, iron and, and uh, on steel bridges today, which date back to iron bridges from the late 18th and the early 19th century. The uh, first iron bridge was uh, constructed in 1779 and still stands, for example. In fact, I believe we have a picture of that. Uh, the iron bridge, uh, it was called iron bridge because the fact that it was made out of iron was its most distinctive feature. The uh, Interesting thing about this bridge, as attractive as it is, and most people consider it to be a rather attractive uh, structure, is that the, the engineers of the time didn't really know how to design to work in iron, if, if you will. As a result, they mimicked the Roman arch. It's a semicircular arch. This is a characteristic of the Romans, as Pontegar uh, showed. Uh, and at the same time, they also mimicked timber structures. So the details of this bridge uh, mimic how timber fits together. Uh, this is fairly typical in technology when you're dealing with a new material that you are unfamiliar with and that you have no models for, you will reach back and draw on what we, you would consider analogous uh, structures. This is uh, a, a, an iron bridge principally because its main means of suspension is an iron chain. Uh, this is called a suspension bridge, and the characteristics of a suspension bridge are it has two towers, it has the chain slung over those towers, the chain is held back by abutments. Those are the massive uh, structures you see at the end, if I can uh, show uh, here, would be one abutment, and there's another one over here obscured by the uh, shrubbery. This bridge was also, this was designed by 
someone who started out as a stonemason. So this person was used to working in stone. And you can see the approaches to this bridge on either side of the main span uh, show, I think, uh, rather uh, elegant, elegant stonework. Very simple, but very well proportioned. And proportion is almost everything in structures like, like this. Uh, the designer of this was Thomas Telford, who was known throughout uh, Scotland and England uh, for establishing so much of their infrastructure about two th 200 years ago. And this bridge still stands as a key piece of infrastructure in northern Wales, for example. Again, the proportions are, are key. This bridge uh, showed uh, early in the 19th century that uh, bridges could span significant distances, in this case over 500 feet between the uh, towers. And that was critical for allowing ships to pass with a good navigation channel. And uh, with, without that achievement, in many cases, bridges like this would not have been allowed to be, to be built. Now this bridge, a bridge like this, didn't have to be an attractive structure. It could also have just been a purely utilitarian structure. Uh, there is nothing that dictates that it had to be a suspension bridge. In fact, Thomas Telford, the designer of this bridge, at first proposed an arch bridge, which is uh, structurally an upside-down suspension bridge. So it, made, it would have made a whole different impact on the, uh, the built environment uh, here. But he had to go with a suspension bridge because the, the arch just cuts down too much clearance on, on, either, on either end. What, what is interesting about, about this bridge to me is it served as an aesthetic model for bridges of this type, suspension bridges, for well over a century. That building bridges, a bridge with these proportions in its main span, the center span, was a goal. And it, in fact, it also influenced the Brooklyn Bridge in, completed in 1883. The Brooklyn Bridge is characterized by its stone towers, much like Telford's work uh, employed stone so much. And out of the view on this picture are a lot of, lot of arches leading up to the uh, bridge proper, again echoing uh, Telford. For a long time, it was thought that in building monumental bridges of this type, of this scale, and the scale here we're talking about, about 1,600 feet between these, these towers, um, this scale demanded stone towers. It was felt. And uh, it, was, it took a while, it was well into the... Uh, 20th century before attractive suspension bridges with steel towers began to be built. So is the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, would you consider it engineering, architecture, science, or art? Uh, very often it's referred to as an architectural masterpiece. Well, you could say that if you, by that you mean that it's a well-proportioned structure. But uh, it was not touched by an architect in, in any way during the design process. Design was, uh, it was conceived and, and designed by engineers without the consultation of architects. Is it science? Well, that depends on what you mean by science. There, there is a science of knowing the strength of steel. This bridge was famous for first using steel as opposed to iron. The only difference effectively is that steel is stronger, and that means you need to use less of it. That means you can get more slender lines on the uh, structure. Is it art? Well, I think uh, I would argue that it's, it's art in the sense that it, it comes from the mind of an individual and it's then translated into something uh, concrete like a piece of sculpture or a painting or even a, a, a poem. The Brooklyn Bridge is famous for its cables that uh, are unconventional. Uh, most modern bridges are not built this way, but the the uh, cabling structure of the Brooklyn Bridge cradles the walkway, that's a pedestrian walkway, that takes people uh, over the traffic. The traffic is below on, on this bridge, and that uh, means that it's quieter for a pedestrian experience, and also it means that the, uh, there is no visual impairment when looking on either side. You can look out into New York Harbor from this bridge and not see traffic, you see the Statue of, of Liberty, for uh, example. The Gothic arches are famous on this bridge and uh, often quoted, actually, in subsequent uh, bridges. Uh, it's, it's just, I would say, a piece of art, not only in its visual aesthetic impact, but also in the uh, pedestrian experience and, and how it, uh, it uh, unites uh, different parts of New York City today. In fact, I just might say in passing that before this bridge was built, 
uh, New York and Brooklyn were two separate cities. Today they're part of one big city, and it's largely because of uh, this, uh, this bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge has actually inspired artists. I thought I'd just uh, mention this in passing. Uh, that uh, To me, that's one of the uh, hallmarks of, of art, is that it, it inspires or uh, in, in implies that other art uh, uh, in, in, uh, inspires other, other art, and the Brooklyn Bridge has done this in spades. There there's, are there's just uh, echoes of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, everywhere in art. Uh, this is just a modern uh, view of the, of the bridge. There are ugly bridges, and I'll just say that just to emphasize and show these, these pictures. Uh, not every bridge that's conceived is, is beautiful, even by engineering terms. There was an engineer named Robert, uh, Joseph Strauss who uh, his specialty was designing small bridges, like on the left here, that were built in industrial areas of town uh, that usually spanned canals or small channels. And uh, they opened uh, like a seesaw, they called bascule bridges, when a boat had to pass and then close. So they were very functional, and there was no uh, great need, it was felt, to make them beautiful. Uh, when the uh, challenge came to span the Golden Gate in California by San Francisco, there, was a, uh, uh, there were a lot of engineers interested, and many of them uh, produced uh, drawings and proposals, uh, most of them with prohibitive price tags, however. Uh, Joseph Strauss, who was the designer of the bridge on the left, proposed himself a bridge to cross uh, the uh, Golden Gate, and his, his uh, proposal is shown on the right from a newspaper clipping. Now, that's a complete proposal. And uh, even at the time, it was considered downright, downright ugly. There's no unity of form to it. And it, it simply is not a pure structure of this kind or that kind. It's a, some kind of a hybrid that is neither here nor there. But the fact that Strauss was proposing a bridge that technically could have worked, and this is in the 19... Uh, 20s, uh, really uh, attracted the interests of people, especially the fact that his price, his, his uh, predicted price, was about one-tenth of what other proposals were. Uh, fortunately, when engineers of modest bridges like the one on the left proposed uh, really ambitious bridges like the one on the, the right, uh, they are uh, wise to uh, consult other engineers who have more direct experience. And in this case, Strauss did, and, and one of the uh, consulting engineers persuaded him to change it to a more pure design, a, a true suspension bridge, which uh, we now know as the Golden, Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, this is still uh, uh, considered you know, one of the masterpieces of bridge engineering in the world of all time. Now, this bridge did have a consulting architect. It, because Strauss was so really ill-prepared to come up with something like this. He not only had consulting engineers, but also a, a consulting uh, architect. And the architect was largely responsible for some of the uh, superficial features, I would say, and I don't mean that in any pejorative sense. Uh, this bridge, when it was built, was the longest uh, span in the world at 4,200 feet. Oops, excuse me. This bridge is the George Washington Bridge. This is also in New York, New York City. Now, this bridge is, is different from the bridges that were being built prior to it. Uh, prior to it, all the bridges, the suspension bridge types in particular, had very deep roadways, or engineers call them decks, between the towers. That's where the traffic travels on. And the reason for that was to make it stiff so it wouldn't bend excessively under heavy, heavy traffic. But in this case, the engineer figured out a way to make the deck stiff enough without it being deep. And it's, this introduced a new aesthetic. This introduced an aesthetic that said that the look that bridges should have to be aesthetically pleasing is that the roadway should look as slender as possible, be like a ribbon of steel between the towers. The span of this bridge is 3,500 feet. It, uh, it's still serving traffic. If you know this bridge today, it, it looks different because a second roadway was added under it. But this, this then set the stage for building bridges in a, a new way, with slender roadways and also with all steel towers. 
And in fact, it was the architect, Le Corbusier, who had nothing directly to do with the design of this bridge, who said this was the most beautiful bridge in the world. And he said other things like that steel architecture has finally come into its, into its own. And it all has to do with proportion. This is, a, this is a, a graphic artist's conception of the Brooklyn Bridge. And as I mentioned earlier, the Brooklyn Bridge not only uh, has suspension cables because it's a true suspension bridge, but it also has radiating cables coming down from the stone towers down to the, to the roadway. Well, this artist saw this bridge in a way that is not true to the form of the bridge because, you see, it has no vertical cables. And the vertical cables are characteristic of a true suspension bridge. The main cable comes from tower to tower, and then from it are hung the, is hung the roadway, much like laundry is from a, from a clothesline. But this is also a reflection of the idea that something like the Brooklyn Bridge is half this and half, half that, but so well integrated that it is considered a true artistic masterpiece. But it's also a belt and suspenders principle in the sense that you could take uh, the main suspension cable away and the bridge would still function. And that led to the concept of what is today called a cable stay bridge. And this is one of the newest forms. There are historical precedents, but it never reached the aesthetic heights that it is being designed and built in today. Uh, this is a bridge in Florida from 1987, as you see. And you see, all that supports this roadway are those cables that are, some people compare them to the strings of a harp, for, for example. And it's a very clean looking design. It's a very light structure, uh, not only visually, but, but also in, in uh, the literal mass that has to be supported. This is a, an alternative. I'll skip some because I've been told we should shorten this a little bit. This is another variation on that cable stay bridge concept. Now, this is an interesting uh, bridge uh, in part because of its designer. The designer of this bridge is Santiago Calatrava. And Calatrava was born in Spain, received an education in architecture in Spain, then went to Switzerland to study structural engineering and received a degree in that also. So he truly is both an engineer and an architect by training. And he also considers himself an artist. And uh, he believes that, that his bridges are, are not only uh, structurally interesting and aesthetically pleasing, but he believes them literally, literally to be works of art. This is a bridge in Seville, Spain. This is another one of his bridges, which I'll skip. You see it's a variation on that other theme. This is a bridge in Boston, and I'll make some comments on this. This is a relatively new uh, bridge. It's a cable stay bridge, but you see it has a lot more complex uh, cabling uh, arrangement. And that's one of the attractions of the form, and that it, it allows so much variation within the basic concept of towers connecting by cables to the, to the roadway. This, this bridge has become so much associated with Boston that at least in the U.S. now, if you watch a news program and you see somebody being interviewed for a news story from Boston, uh, chances are in nine times out of ten that they're actually standing before this bridge because this bridge has become a literal symbol of Boston. And uh, that's, that's true of a, lot of a lot of structures, a lot of bridge structures. This is an example from Maine, that just to uh, allow me to uh, relate a little, little story. In the background is a true suspension bridge, and you can see it with the characteristic uh, shape. Um, because of the nature of the uh, structure, the, the fact of the matter is there's not too much variation you can do in what a, what a suspension bridge looks like in profile. Uh, there are optimum sags of the cable to the length of the uh, span. But in front of this is a modern cable stay bridge, and you see it looks entirely different from uh, the suspension bridge and also entirely different from the cable stay bridges I've been showing. Uh, this was necessitated by the fact that the old suspension bridge was becoming so corroded that it was not safe to use anymore. And very quickly, they had to build a new bridge. And the new bridge is this new cable stay bridge. And it's just an emphasis uh, to me that you can make an attractive structure. You can do it quickly and relatively in inexpensively. This is one of the uh, newest cable stay bridges that is talked a lot about. This is the Miao Viaduct in France. It goes over the Tarn Valley. And uh, 
every bridge has a story about it, why it was built and, and so forth. And this is on the main road from, if you were driving from Paris to Barcelona, you would take this, this path, this route, pretty, pretty much. And it used to, before this bridge was there, go down into the valley, wind around through little villages and come up. And it really added a lot to the trip and also uh, created a lot of congestion in these small towns. But the small towns had gotten used to that, and in fact, it was a great source of revenue for them, tourist dollars and uh, uh, people staying overnight and so forth. So when the bridge was proposed to eliminate the traffic jams and so forth, there was opposition from the local, local community. But uh, the, the wisdom of the French uh, Department of Transportation uh, basically went ahead with the bridge, and it's, it's become famous so much so that uh, people come and drive now and visit the small villages just to look up at the bridge. It's notable for being one of the highest bridges in the world, measured in terms of where the uh, roadway is, but it's also one of the most striking. Now, this also bridge uh, emphasizes that things are changing. Architects are becoming increasingly uh, involved very visually, very, uh, very um, uh, yes, visually and, and also uh, very visibly in the design of these bridges. And in fact, so much so that this bridge, which you see is relatively new, five years old, is often attributed to the, the rather famous architect, the British architect Norman Foster. In fact, he, he was the architect. That can mean several things in large projects like bridges of the kind I'm talking about today. One is it can mean that the architect actually has the contract to, um, to uh, design and build the bridge, with the, the engineers being sort of in a consulting uh, form. Uh, but seldom does it mean that the architect has anything to do uh, with the structure per se. And in this case, Michael Virlajou, who is the, the engineer, uh, really uh, should be credited equally with the architect, but generally is not. But however you look at it, it to me, it's a, it's a, a work of art. It, it, in the sense that it, it actually adds, seems to add, to the environment, the natural environment, rather than compete with it or, or, or work against it. This is just another view of that bridge. I understand this is a local bridge. I haven't seen it yet. I hope to see it this, this weekend. Uh, to me, this is another example of a variation in cable stay uh, bridges. Uh, again, in cable stay bridges, as with uh, suspension bridges, there is often uh, a, a, a look to the towers to distinguish one bridge from another because after a while, you run out of very, uh, very variations. So uh, one way of getting a distinctive bridge is to hold what is called a design competition. This has been done in Europe for quite a while. In the United States, it's becoming uh, more popular, but at a slow pace. Basically, a design competition means this, that a bridge for a specified purpose is desired, and uh, interdisciplinary teams can be specified to be uh, required to work together. Uh, so if a town wants a bridge for a particular purpose at a particular location, they'll say that you must have an architect and an engineer working, working together. And uh, so masterpieces are being uh, uh, produced. In London, for example, there was a desire to have a pedestrian bridge between the two uh, tourist attractions of St. Paul's Cathedral and the power station across the way. Now, why is a power station a tourist attraction? Well, because it was converted into a modern art gallery. And this is the bridge that resulted. It was known, it's known as the London Millennium Bridge. Again, Norman Foster, was involved, uh, but the engineering firm of Arup, uh, named after a Danish engineer, and a sculptor, Robert Carroll, was also involved. And the reason uh, for, for this uh, was that it was mandated by the design competition, that you couldn't, you couldn't enter this design competition with a proposal unless you had a team represented by these three disciplines. So the, it's a clear signal that the bridge is desired to be a work of art as well as a work of engineering. If you know the story of this bridge, it actually turned out to be an embarrassment in that uh, shortly after it opened, actually for three days only, uh, the bridge wobbled considerably side to side when a lot of people got on it, so it had to be closed to be reconsidered. And it's an example of if you can't let art uh, lead, take the lead uh, at the expense of structure. The structure obviously has to work. <clears throat> Let me just talk quick, briefly about the Gateshead Millennium Bridge. That's across the Tyne River, Newcastle in northern England. This is historically a very significant river, very significant port. 
a lot of historic bridges that, that each has its own story. So part of the requirement here was they, they wanted a pedestrian bridge downriver, but it had to complement, not compete with, the historic bridges. And uh, it also had to be a pedestrian bicycle bridge across this uh, river, and it had to be at, at K level so that uh, people and bikes didn't have to go up and then come down. At the same time, it had to echo the arches. All of this was explicitly stated, and it was also explicitly stated that an engineer and an architect who had experience in working on problems like this had to uh, come up with the uh, design. This was essentially the uh, sketch, and as I said, you know, things begin in uh, somebody's mind's eye. Now, there may be a team working on this, but some single individual has to articulate something that brings out then uh, an involvement of a team, and this was the uh, genesis of this winning entry. This is a more sc scoped out, and this is such a novel design that it actually uh, is not easy to conceive either, even after seeing the drawings, but this is the bridge. Basically, it has an arch form. There are cables coming down, so in that way it's like a cable stay bridge, but then this roadway comes swinging out in front. That's the pedestrian and bicycle uh, path. Now, how do you let large ships pass this, which was one of the requirements? Well, the thing turns on its hinges, if you will, and this is it in the so-called open position, and if you look upriver from this position, you see how it echoes so nicely the bridge, uh, the old historic bridges. Uh, this is really a novel idea. Uh, there are no historical precedents for something exactly uh, like this. Uh, it's, it's considered a, a work of art. Uh, the, uh, the British generally had a lot of um, uh, bridges called Millennium Bridges, have a lot called Millennium Bridges, because in preparation for the coming of the year 2000, they wanted to invite proposals that would not only add function to situations such as this, but also add, literally add art, to add to the natural, or the, the uh, existing environment. And here's the bridge open, and you can see that it's totally consistent with the old bridges. Well, let me just uh, end by uh, saying that there are other, a lot of other uh, bridges around the world being designed and built, and I, I mean literally around the world. In fact, some of the most exciting uh, bridge design and building now taking place is actually happening in this part of the world that uh, some of the uh, longest and most uh, creative bridges are being designed and built uh, here. In Dublin, where I was last summer, that I came across uh, this bridge. This is another Santiago Calatrava bridge, and I show this for, for a variety of reasons. One, to emphasize that a, a given engineer or architect can come up with, uh, you can see the art, artist's signature in it, but at the same time you can see quite the variation in what the artist uh, has done, the, the architect, engineer. Uh, the James Joyce Bridge is supposed to represent an open book. It, the arches uh, flay out on, on either side. They, uh, there's actually a curvature to it looking down, which uh, encloses a quiet area where people can sit and gather without being caught up in the traffic going one way or the other. The uh, base of the bridge, the floor of the bridge is glass uh, so that people can experience the, the river below, and the river Liffey is just you know, very significant for James Joyce's work. So it's a, it's a structure, it's a bridge in this case that not only is a, a unique uh, structure in its own right, but also pays homage to the, the art that uh, the namesake of the bridge uh, uh, created. So let me just end there in the interest of time, but I've tried to just give a quick uh, example of a, of a variety of bridges that uh, I consider to be pieces of art as well as pieces of engineering. And uh, I think there's general agreement that these bridges that I showed have this distinction. And there are a lot more of them. Uh, and uh, there, there are a lot of bridges, uh, a lot of books about bridges. And they're, they're big and coffee table books like, like art books uh, because that's what they deserve, that kind of format to truly appreciate uh, the bridge as, as art. Thank you very much.